G'day guys, Rukshani here. Thanks for joining me for the news vlog. I hope you're having a lovely day. First story I'm going to be talking about is this arrival of a boat from Indonesia via Pakistan, uh, carrying, I believe, uh, some Pakistani individuals and Bangladeshi individuals who are seeking asylum here. Now, this boat full of about 30 or so illegal immigrants, all men that have arrived in Beagle Bay in Western Australia, has bypassed all our border security under the Labour government, Albanese government. And this is happening more and more. We're discussing issues to do with immigration. Of course, we have that, that disaster of 149 criminals being released out into the public, people who have records for murdering or for uh, kidnapping, for sexual abuse of children. They've been let out under the community by our immigration minister under the Labour government. And now we have these boats arriving as well, full of illegal immigrants. Now, in this instance, these Pakistani individuals especially are saying that they are subject to torture in Pakistan, and that is why they're seeking asylum here. At least one individual who's arrived on this boat has uh, previously been deported from Australia, and he is now returning, saying that he's being tortured. He's left his wife and children behind, and he hopes after he seeks asylum and gets it approved here in Australia that he can bring his family around as well. So that is the situation with this boat arrival, and like I said, we're talking more and more about these type of issues all around the world, and I think it's maybe kicking up in Australia as well. I think we've had about 11 arrivals since Albanese took the helm of these uh, similar types of boats, and this particular one, uh, it's quite interesting based on the fact that uh, this video that I saw on ABC, you have, um, let me just play it for you. So you can see the police there, they're talking to these um, illegal immigrants, and you have this lady here who's hugging hugging the, one of them. There's another man behind the, the youth as well. This lady's hugging this other illegal immigrant as well. I think these are potentially the locals that found them wandering around. They had wandered into a local community and were asking for water as per the reporting. Uh, you can see the, these men in the images that you're seeing, uh, they, they're young men. Uh, they're dressed, you know, in track pants and jeans and shirts. My thoughts on all of this is I think we do have an issue around this um, immigration problem, especially with, you know, these so-called refugees and asylum seekers. I work a lot within uh, these communities and I speak to a lot of different people. And I've grown up in this type of uh, communities as well, where there's been influxes of asylum seekers or refugees seeking status here in Australia. And a majority of the time, many of them are doing it for purely economical reasons. The people who are coming aren't facing the consequences that they're telling you that they're facing overseas. It's all BS. Uh, a lot of it's exaggerated. A lot of it's made up. Um, the fact that their families are still there, despite them running away from these, you know, tyrannical governments that want to torture them and so forth, it makes you wonder. And I think, you know, it's just the system being exploited in Australia and people in, in those parts of the world or anywhere that's seeking asylum in Australia knows how to exploit the system in this country and they see the weakness and they want to get through. A lot of these people have the means to pay tens of thousands of dollars to get on these boats. They come from usually middle income uh, households or uh, well-to-do families that maybe um, have the money and the means to pay for these type of individuals to get through. Now, this is not the case all of the time. There are genuine asylum seekers and genuine refugees, and I do understand and I do believe that countries have an obligation to help them. But what we're seeing here is, you know, these men got to Indonesia. If they're escaping torture, they've got to Indonesia from Pakistan, allegedly. Indonesia is a, um, a, a Muslim country. Would they not be safe seeking asylum in, in Indonesia? I'm just saying the reason of coming to Australia is economic in, in many respects and because of the systems that we have in place. So those systems should not be exploited. They should actually be available for genuine refugees and genuine asylum seekers, not people who have the means, uh, you know, who have been deported previously or whatever it is uh, to get, get through that system. They break the law and they come here illegally. They jump the queues and they cut the queues for people who are actually trying to migrate to this country legally because that's very difficult as well. And it's not just through um, these type of uh, boat arrivals that the system is exploited. We have the system being exploited in our, by, through our university systems. This happens a lot and it's widely known within communities. It's widely discussed. A lot of the time, migrant populations are laughing about the stupidity of the white man, to put it in, in the simplest terms possible. I'm not trying to be offensive. They're laughing about the stupidity of people in these countries and how easy it is to exploit it. So it takes strong leadership. It takes tough borders and it takes deportation with, with due process. Everyone should deserves due process. Let's say this 
with that process, if, if they're found not to be authentic, you send them back straight away. We have to be tough like this. Otherwise, we're just letting these countries like Australia just sink down to the levels of what we're seeing in Europe and parts of America. We are so fortunate that we have this massive border of the ocean around us and it's difficult for people to get here because if you, when you see people hugging individuals like this and this kind of thing, you might think it's compassionate and this, but I just see the weakness of this nation who doesn't really have any identity of who they are and what's important about protecting in this country such as Australia. So that's my thoughts on this. I know I deviated a little bit, but I wanted to share some of my personal opinions on this matter. Now, when Albanese was asked about this earlier today, this is what he had to say. Minister, we're, we're hearing that an asylum seeker boat has arrived off the Western Australian coastline. Do you know anything about that? Uh, I've been travelling in the car, yep. uh, so I, I'm not, uh, I haven't been uh, advised about that. Are the Prime Minister's phone. Anyway, that's uh, Albo. Pauline Hansen has also made some comments. I'll just play some of that. Well, surprise, surprise, another boatload of illegals have landed on the shores of Australia. Since the High Court decision, how many has it been? Uh, I'll just play Peter Dutton's comments as well, he actually. In the car. He should have taken a call. He should have called his minister in return to ask what is going on. Uh, the people smugglers can pick out a weak leader, a weak prime minister and a weak minister, and it's exactly what they've done. Now, we've warned about this for some time, that all of the pull factors, releasing the 149 criminals, uh, watering down Operation Sovereign Borders, uh, that sends a clear message to the people smugglers, and that's when they get back in business. 100% I agree with P Peter, Peter Dutton. There is a massive people smuggling industry across Asia. I can speak to that because I come from that part of the world. My family hails from that part of the world. And it, it is an industry. And there are people who are willing to do this, exploit the system. They make a ton of money by promising people things. Um, and, you know, a lot of the times people are trying to get out of a bad situation, a rough situation. But, you know, are they genuine asylum seekers? Are, is, are their lives genuinely in threat? And are they being terrorized? No. Uh, they just happen to live in, you know, crappier countries compared to Australia, and they want to get here. Now, you know, bleeding hearts might think like, okay, let's just let everyone in. But we know that doesn't work because first we have to look after the people that are in this country legally. We have to look after the Australian. We have to look after everything else in this country because our services, our standard of living, all those issues become impacted when these issues become prevalent. And you're seeing that in, in America. You have the southern border where illegals are streaming across. You have people being put up in hotels and all sorts of nonsense, and you're just seeing how much of the impact it's having on the rest of society. We can't become like that in Australia. So I'm definitely on board with uh, very tough and strong immigration laws and protecting our border. The next news I have, guys, is from France. There's been some interesting laws which have been pushed through, and I'm just going to read a little bit of this article to give you a context around these laws. France, criticism of mRNA will be punishable in the future. A new criminal offence in France could in the future land people in prison who encourage people to withhold appropriate medical treatment, according to science. The law was pushed through the National Assembly on Wednesday. Critics called the law Article Pfizer. Without much attention, a law passed in France on Wednesday that could criminalize resistant to mRNA treatment. Anyone who advises against mRNA or other medical treatments that are obviously suitable for treatment based on the current state of medical knowledge can in the future be imprisoned in France for up to three years or receive a fine of up to 45,000 euros. Very draconian stuff. Now, we saw the dangers over the last couple of years of disallowing expert opinion that opposes uh, many of the times government narrative. We've seen firsthand how important it is to have debate and to have, have people opposing certain policies and plans, especially ones which are being pushed through by pharmaceutical companies. There needs to be debate around this and there needs to be you know, strict, uh, a strict contest of ideas around these policies. And to think that laws are being passed now to make it criminalized in France to criticize some of these issues. Uh, very draconian indeed. Now, the next story that I have, guys, is a WA man faces jail for disrupting Rainbow Serpent after building bridge over creek on his property. <laughs> a Western Australian man is facing a hefty fine and a potential jail term under the state's cultural heritage laws for allegedly disrupting the Rainbow Serpent after building a bridge over a creek on his property. Tony Maddox, a prominent local real estate agent in the town of Today, 
85 kilometers northeast of Perth, was char charged by the state's Department of Planning, Land and Heritage last year for breaching WA's Aboriginal Heritage Act of 1972. In August last year, the state government ditched sweeping new Aboriginal cultural heritage laws after just 39 days of operation following widespread community backlash and fears the controversy was affecting public support for the voice referendum. Thank God the voice referendum did not pass through. Um, Mr. Maddox was charged under the un amended 1972 laws for building a creek crossing on his property, which the, pro which the prosecution claimed had disrupted Wagul, a rainbow serpent central to the mythology of the Noongar people, as he removed a large amount of silt uh, from the creek, Sky News reported. He pled not guilty in the North Mag Northern Magistrates Court and is set to face a two-day trial in Perth starting on Thursday, February 22nd. Again, uh, I think this is just going to become more and more prevalent, these type of laws, especially now that we're having Regardless of the voice not being passed, the fact that uh, you know Anthony Albanese has stressed that treaty negotiations, whether it's federally or statewide, continues. We've seen in Victoria these treaty neg negotiations, the First Peoples Assemblies, and you see these pushes uh, around uh, contest for land and you know giving land back to the Aboriginal people. That's how it's being phrased. You have uh, Lydia Thorpe's, I think, uncle um, out in the King's Domain. He's pitched a tent. Uh, wanting to claim their land back. And you have this incident here of this gentleman uh, for disrupting the rainbow serpent. I mean, the way that these things are headed, uh, especially on people who are living in more uh, rural or regional areas, um, amongst some of these communities, they might find it very difficult uh, in, in the future. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens in this case and, and which way the ruling actually goes. Uh, and just another uh, lot of uh, <laughs> weird laws which are being discussed. Hundred signed petition calling for Victorian government to ban fireworks in the state due to damage to people and animals. Hundreds of Victorians have joined the push. I just want to reiterate re re there. Hundreds have joined the push to have the state uh, government enact a ban on all firework displays due to the damage caused to people and animals. A petition before the Legislative Council calling for the ban has so far signed by almost 600 people with residents having until February 29th to add their voice. Disability advocate Shannon Meek started the petition amid concerns for people with PTSD or sensory conditions who are triggered by fireworks as well as wildlife. Fireworks may be pretty, pretty to look at and it's entertaining for some, but for many others they are frightening and risk their health and even their lives, the petition states. People with PTSD or sensory conditions such as autism may suffer sensory overload, panic attacks and anxiety, which may potentially lead to self-harm or suicide. Look, I get what this individual is trying to say, but can we live in such a bubble wrapped world? Really? Like, can we really do that? Can we say, let's ban fireworks? Uh, because, you know, it might lead to someone harming themselves if it does have some issue that it, it triggers. Really? I mean, there's so many things that could trigger something like that uh, for, for an individual if it's about sensory overload. And fireworks is, uh, you know, it happen, doesn't happen all the time. It's very um, sparse when it does happen. It's in, it's in, controlled areas around Australia. Not everyone's letting off fireworks all over the place. I could understand if people were just getting fireworks in their backyards all the time and just letting it off, but it happens for like New Year's, it happens for special occasions. Uh, can we really go down this path of let's, okay, let's just ban fireworks because, you know, 600 people signed a petition based on what? What's next, right? These things continue on and on and on. So I think this is ridiculous. As sorry as I feel for the individuals that might suffer these extreme conditions of this, uh, there has to be other ways to protect them without uh, having the rest of society uh, just, you know, stop doing things that are very normal things to do. This one, guys, is from Canada. Trudeau and Freeland sued by Freedom Convoy protesters following federal court ruling. So a couple of weeks ago, I discussed that ruling in Canada, which said that uh, Justin Trudeau's actions, the, in the enactment of those emergency powers during those trucker convoys was illegal, according to the federal court, because it overstepped the bounds and uh, now you have individuals based on that kind of finding uh, now personally suing people like Justin Trudeau and Christia Freeland, the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada. Let me just read a bit of this article. A number of Freedom Convoy protesters who had their bank accounts frozen by the Trudeau government invocation of emergencies acts have sued the Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christia Freeland. The development comes just weeks after the federal court judge ruled that Trudeau's decision to invoke the Emergencies Act, which gave the government unprecedented power, was a violation of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Two lawsuits were announced on Wednesday, the first was, which was announced by a lawyer, Keith Wilson. 
Breaking, on the second year anniversary of the federal government legally invoking war measures against its citizens and targeting key protesters in Ottawa by freezing their bank accounts, today, Tamara Leach, Chris Barber, Tom Marazzo, Danny Bulford, and other protesters who were targeted by Justin Trudeau and Kerr Freeland have filed lawsuits against the federal government. So yeah, great development there. It's really very interesting to see how this ruling, uh, if this case progresses, <laughs> let's see who knows they might settle with these people, that, who knows what the government will do. But if it does progress to the courts, based on the finding of that federal court as well, because I think that's still in, has it gone to appeal? I'm not sure. Let me know if you know that for sure. It'll be interesting to see what happens in this instance. All right, guys, now to some news from the US. We've got Fannie Willis, the DA in uh, Georgia, who is going after Trump on that RICO uh, racketeering uh, Trump and I think 16 or 17 other people for election uh, meddling or trying to steal the election, as she says. And you would remember her bravado uh, last year when she was bringing up these charges against Trump and the way she kind of walks around like she owns the whole world type thing. Well, we've since found out that Fannie Willis is involved in her own uh, potentially shady activities with a prosecutor who was put in charge of prosecuting the Trump case as well. And they've been having some affair that came out during that prosecutor's divorce case. And there's all these cash payments and there's all these trips overseas together. It seems very inappropriate for the DA and this prosecutor to be involved in this fashion. And there's a case going on around that because they want to see if that she, you know, she's legible to be actually sitting as the DA on this case related to Trump. So it's very interesting. There's fireworks in the courtroom. It's only been one day and it's been quite entertaining as a courtroom drama from the US. It just shows you how ridiculous the entire country is. It's a banana republic. Uh, Donald Trump is against these type of individuals who are going after him. Let's have a listen to a little bit of Fannie Willis having a meltdown today. Uh, Ms. I Richard, to... if you could ask a more precise question. Yes, please. Give me the time period. Yes. Mr. Wade visits you at the place you laid your head. When? Has he ever visited you at the place you laid your head? So let's be clear because you've lied in this, this. Let me tell you which one you lied in right here. I think you lied right here. No, 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 no. This is the truth. Judge, and this it, is, it, it is a lie. It is a lie. Ms. Willis, Mr. Sena, thank you. We're going to take five minutes. Be back in five. That's just one example. There's so many examples of her having a meltdown. It's hilarious. But amongst all of that, the funniest is now maybe that she was wearing her dress. The dress that she was wearing was on the wrong way around, according to some images which have been uh, shared around online of the dress that she's wearing and the images of her wearing it. It looks like it was back to front now. That's just a funny side note that I'm sharing with you. But if you're interested, uh, MSNBC, uh, Fox News, they do live stream uh, some of this uh, case as it goes to air. I'm pretty sure you can find it on YouTube as well. If you've got nothing to do, it's like watching Days of Our Lives. It's very entertaining. You know, you can you can waste a little bit of time watching Fannie Willis having a cry over democracy and Donald Trump and all types of other nonsense as she's being called out on an affair that she had with a married man. Crazy stuff. All right, guys, and last up, we have Tucker Carlson. What? Tucker Carlson really? is, uh, you know, he was in Russia for his interview with Putin, but during that time he was there, he did a, a few short videos, and one of the short videos he did was going to a supermarket in Russia and showing people around the supermarket. Now, whenever we hear about Russia, what Tucker Carlson's trying to point out is that we hear that there's sanctions against Russia, you know, the, the economy is so crap, the, the treatment of, you know, businesses is so crap that it's not a thriving place. It's not a place where people can even get the basic necessities of life. But here is Taka visiting a supermarket. Let's have a look. Here we go. So I guess you put in 10 rubles here and you get it back when you put the cart back. So it's free, but there's an incentive to return it and not just bring it to your homeless encampment. Okay, this is the now that's pretty funny with the trolley thing. I think all trolleys in Australia have that. It's hard for me to believe that maybe Taka doesn't do shopping. Some people are saying in America they don't have that in the trolleys. All the trolleys here, we have that, right? You got to put a dollar in or two dollars in. I don't get it back until you push it back in at the end of your shopping. Well, apparently for Taka, it's a revelation when he sees it in Russia because I think there's homeless people or there's you know junkies in America all the place, all around the place walking around with trolleys that they've stolen from Costco or wherever else, so pretty funny. The uh, grocery cart escalator. <laughs> this is designed, I'm figuring this out now, where the wheels don't move, they lock on the grocery cart escalator. Look. Even that, we have it in Australia. So look, I'm not making fun of Taka, but this is pretty funny that he's finding this stuff in Russia. I'm just trying to think how behind America is potentially. Anyway, you can go watch this video. It goes for a few minutes. 
and it's literally Tucker shopping in Russia and just showing you that, look, there's all these products that we have in the West. They have all the same things. And you know what? At the end of this, if you're buying for a family of four, it actually ends up so much cheaper than buying groceries in the US or probably in Australia as well compared with our current conditions. So we actually eat over a week. And we all came in around 400 bucks, about 400 bucks. Um, it was $104 US here. And that's when you start to realize that ideology maybe doesn't matter as much as you thought, corruption. If you take people's- I mean, it's an interesting point that Tucker's, Tucker's trying to make that, you know, if people can, you know, shop, buy food, uh, have the necessities in life in an affordable manner, they might generally be happy. And, you know, in the West, yes, we have all of these ideas and concepts but, you know, we, the cost of living, it's hard for us to even go shopping sometimes, depending on, you know, your circumstances. And maybe we don't really understand how that impacts people. And maybe the people in Russia, despite the way that they're portrayed, maybe they're happy with Putin. Maybe they're happy with the government. I mean, it's an interesting way to look at these things. Anyway, guys, I hope you've enjoyed my show today. I did ramble on a little bit. Uh, you can find me on YouTube at The Real Rukshan. Hit that subscribe button, or you can also hit the notification bell and Apparently, it'll give you updates as I post. Otherwise, YouTube doesn't show you, maybe. Uh, you can also find me on X, Facebook, Rumble, Odyssey, and Instagram at The Real Rukshan. All right, guys. See you tomorrow.